So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu, nasta'inuhu, wa nasta'afiru. So today I want to talk about Surah Al-Kahf in Ukraine. And what I have to share with you is insha'Allah going to be very eye-opening. For those of you who have read Surah Al-Kahf will be able to relate to my discussion quite easily. Um, so inshallah ta'ala, uh, let's get started. Um, I'm going to try to make some very, very important connections with the travels of Zulqarnain and put in the context of the situation of the world today. Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the journey of Zulqarnain. The first journey he makes is where حَتَّى إِذَا بَلَغَ مَغْرِبَ الشَّمْسِ وَجَدَهَا تَغْرِبُ فِي عَيْنٍ حَمِئَةٍ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And Zulqarnain in his first trip, Allah didn't say first trip, I'm adding that. He goes to a place where he sees عَيْنٍ حَمِئَةٍ Ain is a body of fresh water. And so it has to be a place that has fresh water. Number two, it has to be a place that is what? Covered with land. Because Ain is a well. Ain is also the eye, as you know, eye and Ain. English word I comes from the Arabic word Ain. And it's covered by uh, the bone. So it is a land locked body of water. It has to be fresh, has to be large enough to see the sun setting in it. And if you see that the earth is spherical as we have for 2000 years, then you know that the line of sight will lose the sun, but the sun will continue to shed its light on the sea because the sea is much bigger than the person's space of line of sight. Now, the other thing about this is that it has to do something with murky, dark water. So that is the first landmark. The first landmark has to have certain qualities. The second landmark is that he goes and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the justice of Zulqarnain, and in the first trip, he says, "Ya Zulqarnain, O Zulqarnain, imma an tu'adhiba wa imma an tattakhida fihim husna." You can punish them, or you can treat them kindly. Meaning, there is a certain type of people that are here, which we will discuss after we look at the three landmarks. The second landmark is where he sees instead of the sun setting he sees the sun rising i want you to keep in mind when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the ashabul kahf allah mentions the rising first and then the setting after in the trip of zulqarnain so in the first story allah mentions the sun rising from the east and setting in the west and in the story of Zulqarnain, and I'll tell you why I feel this is so today, that in the story of Zulqarnain, Allah starts with the rise, the setting of the sun first. And then he takes his trip to the other side of the world where the sun rises. Okay? And where the sun rises, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes that as a land. <clears throat> As a land, لم يج... لم that we placed, provided them no shelter from the sun. As a place that has no shades, no tall trees. It is a desert. And so, then there is a third journey. And in this journey, he, there are mountains and a mountain pass. And Ya'juj and Ma'juj are mentioned. And a people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes as 
what la yakaduna yafqahuna qawla they were as if they could barely hear what they're saying they could barely understand what they're saying why i will show you why today but these were a people that number one they spoke a similar language but yet a different language but with some resemblance so allah says it was as if they couldn't understand they could barely understand what they were saying <coughs> but then in order to show that it was more of an understanding than not understanding the can the qalu ya dhal qannain inna ya'juja wa ma'juja mufsiduna fil ard oh zul qannain ya'juja and ma'juj are causing corruption in the world in the land so they were then saying hal naj'al lak kharajan <coughs> should we o zul qannain make for you a tax should we pay you to build for us a sadda a wall and he says no i'll make you a radma i'll make you a big wall a strong wall to protect you from this fasad that's happening in the north of this mountainous region which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls it you know hatta idha balagha saddaini until they reached a point of saddain two like mountains right there's a valley type situation and then they build a wall over there to protect them from yajuj and majuj now i ask you to look at the world and tell me where you will find the following qualities the following landmarks the first landmark is a seed that has something to do with being murky and it is a place where the sun sets meaning it has to be in the west and it is a place that is landlocked and it should have fresh water so this is an has to have this somewhere in the world so a body of water that is landlocked fresh has something to do with black and something to do with the fact that zulkarnain would punish the people if they were doing wrong the other one is a place where there is no shade from the sun and that is where the quran says the sun comes out from very important words and the third one is a mountain pass in which there are a people la yafqahuna la yakaduna yafqahuna qawla it's almost as if you couldn't understand what they're saying so these are three landmarks a desert a sea with a desert with some qualities a sea with certain qualities and a mountain pass with some qualities where in the world can you find this <coughs> you can only find this in one place but this is what the quran tells us but now let me share with you some of these qualities of the black sea first because that's the only place that can be and i will show you why so let's get to it inshallah bismillah so the first thing i want to show is about the black sea okay is that the fresh the while it is agreed black water has a fresh water lake at least in the upper layers so the black water or the black sea is fresh on the top layers and basically dead in the bottom layers of water so the heavy heavy water is on the bottom and then the light water is on top which again shows the earth is not flat and that gravity is real which the muslims discovered a long time ago but that's not the issue right now while it is agreed the fresh water lake has been a fresh water lake in the upper parts okay of the lake so it's an up so the first quality of fresh water and the second quality is that it is a inland black sea is an inland meaning it is a sea that's in in locked in uh inland okay and then <clears throat> the as far as why does it look black as for the sunset 
in the Black Sea, kind of looks like this. This is maybe what Zulqarnain saw, and or something like this. And as far as the experience of sailors, they call it Black Sea because it becomes extremely dark in the winter time, especially when there's bad weather. It becomes very, very dark and murky. Okay, so now Black Sea and this region where there is the desert, which I'm going to talk about, which is called Khorasan. And Khorasan means the place where, where, where the sun rises. And I will talk about why Allah mentions the sun setting first and the sun rising after. And then the fitna in the, in the third. Versus in the Ashab al-Kahf, Allah mentions the sun rising first and setting. Okay, so now the Black Sea is an interesting place also because if you remember, the verse talks about Zulqarnain met a people that what? That he was going to punish or let them go out of kindness depending upon how they were acting. Now let us look at one historical fact. So and that is, did pirates ever operate in the Black Sea? And the answer is yes, of course, there were all kinds of Black Sea pirates over the millennia from ancient Greeks to Ukrainian and Russian Cossacks. Now, this is also important because Khidr Kahf mentions pirates. When the two boys had a boat and Khidr put a hole in the boat that was to pr protect them from a pirate who was taking away everyone else's ships. Okay, This situation will come back when people will be living in the sea because what? The fitna in the land will be too much to live there, as the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But anyhow, in here, the situation is that uh, Zulqarnain is uh, coming to a place that has fresh water, that is landlocked, that looks murky water, blackish. He meets a people that he might punish or treat them kindly. Historically speaking, the only place that fits that landmark is the Black Sea. And if that is true, then the other two should also fit in this. So now let's look at the other aspects of the other place from where the sun rises. And so let me just show you Khorasan, the name Khorasan is a Farsi word that means where the sun comes from or arrives from. And what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in Surah Al-Kahf? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Kahf, Hatta until idha balagha matli'a shams. He reached a place where it was the rising of the sun. And what does Khorasan mean? Khorasan, the word Khorasan means the rising of the sun, from where the sun comes. And then Surah Al-Kahf tells us another quality of this area which is hatta idha balagha balagha matli'a ash-shams wajadaha tatli'u ala qaumin lam yajid lahum min duniha sitra he found there people who had no protection from the sun okay and they had no protection from it and so when we look at this place khorasan do we find anything in the hadith literature telling us that that Zulqarnain made a trip to Khorasan? And the answer is yes. In the Musnad of Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sami'atu Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam yaqul, Satakunu ba'di ba'uthatun kathiratun, after me will be many expeditions. Fatakunu fi ba'thil Khorasan, so be in the expedition of Khorasan, thumma anzilu Madinata Marwa, thumma anzilu Madinatul Marwa, and find or be in the city of Marwa, fa innahu banaha Dhulqarnain, because it was built by Dhulqarnain, wa da'a laha bi baraka, and he prayed for its baraka, la yadiru ahlaha su. It will not affect the people of its harm. So this area in Khorasan was built by Zulqarnain, and this was a place 
that had no shelter from the sun. Let me share with you what it looked like. Now this is Khorasan. Okay, pictures of Khorasan. There's no trees, no shade. Okay, there is snow, but there's no shade. There's no shade, there's very little trees, as you can see. Very little trees, very arid. Now I want you to consider that if you're running an entire army to attack and you have to go through this big desert called Khorasan, it's going to be very difficult. And if you're going to come through this dangerous waters, where there are pirates, and this dangerous water you have to go around, that's also very dangerous. So the only thing in the middle was these mountain ranges that you can go through. And so that was where, and I'm going to come to that uh, in a second. So we've talked about the Black Sea. We've talked about Khorasan. The Black Sea is pointing to where the problem is. And the Khorasan is pointing to where the part of the solution is. And then what is in the middle is going to tell you where it will start. This is one interpretation. But you'll see why I give this interpretation when we talk about the rise and the setting of the sun. Then in that context, it will become more clear. Okay? But the brothers and sisters should think, okay, why did Allah mention the rising of the sun in the case of this Ashab al kahf first and the setting second. In the case of Zulqarnain, Allah mentions the setting first and the rising second. Allah mentions the Black Sea first, Khorasan second, and then the mountain range. Is there a reason for that? Is there a purpose behind that? Maybe the side of Black Sea is built first and then the Khorasan side and then the Fitna that will happen in the middle. I don't look at it like that as of yet, but there are many possibilities here. We have to keep thinking and keep deliberating. And we have to find the answers within Quran, from Quran, within Quran. Okay? And so, let me now show you. This is the city of Merv, mentioned in the Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu about where Zulqarnain went and prayed ruins of the city of Marv. Okay? And the city is still there. It's still there, but there are parts of it that have ruins in it. Okay? And Marv is actually a large area within Khorasan. There's a whole area called Marv. Uh, one day, inshallah, if I have maps where actually it goes into great detail, Marv is one of the four major parts of Khorasan, the bigger parts. Anyway, so now, this land, this sea, Black Sea, Khorasan, and then the mountains in the middle, and over there they put a barrier. Now, what does Quran say about this mountain pass and about its people? It's as if they couldn't understand what was being said. Is there a reason for that? Let me share with you. For you, this little area is one of the world's great linguistic hot zones, a place where the mountains are full of languages. Welcome to the Caucasus. Georgia is a U.S. state that's about 300 miles tall with a population over 10 million. Most everyone here speaks one language, English. A turn of the globe away, straddling the southeast of Europe, is a country we call Turkey. And east of Turkey, there's another Georgia. Watch what happens when I take Georgia and put it over Georgia. There's a lot more Georgia left. It leaks into Russia and over into Azerbaijan. It even covers part of Armenia and Turkey. All these borders between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, uh, but these are nothing compared to the number of languages here. As the Kurdish saying goes, we have no friends but the mountains. Uh, I don't know Kurdish, or the more than 50 languages of the Caucasus, but Kurdish is a distant relative of the words I'm speaking right now. It's in the Iranian branch of our Indo-European family, which is something it shares with the Scythian's last descendant, Ossetian. You can hear echoes of familiar words, like the word for door, Dei, Vlad. In Armenia, a door sounds similar, Dur. But Armenian is a separate Indo-European branch. Their unique alphabet was created by this gentleman, scholar, Mr. Mashtots, making Armenian one of the rare languages in the region with its own old writings. Some Armenians claim Mashtots also taught the Georgians how to write, but Georgians beg to differ. Armenian splits another language down the middle in this disputed turf, where the name you give it, and whether you call the fighting in the 90s liberation or occupation, is tense stuff. 
This other language belongs to the country with the world's lowest capital, nearly 100 feet, 30 meters below sea level. Azerbaijani, after all that Indo-European, it looks strange. Unless, you know, Turkish. The Turkic family has multiple branches all over the Caucasus. It builds long words with glued on endings where the vowels harmonize. A lot like Hungarian, remember? Things aren't so Turkic up here in Europe's only Buddhist region. This is Kalmykia, a Russian republic settled by Oirats, who speak a relative of Mongolian. <laughs> there's Mongolic here, there's Hellenic here, Caucasus Greek, there's Semitic, Assyrian Neo-Aramaic. But there was one obvious blob we ignored. Come on, who brings the big guns into this area? <laughs> Metaphorically speaking, of course, Russian, in the Slavic branch of Indo-European. V. A couple years ago, Russia held the Winter Olympics in the city of Sochi. Drama ensued. What attracted a lot of press was the exorbitant cost, but there's another controversy you may have missed. Ethnic Circassians have long considered Sochi their land, taken in the 1800s when the Russian Empire vowed to conquer the Caucasus and pacify, or expel, every indigenous group. One of the men in that army was Leo Tolstoy, and this is where he tasted war and started writing. The last speaker of Sochi's Ubik language died in Turkey in 1992. With him perished the largest consonant inventory outside of Africa, over three times as many as English, and just to be extreme, only two basic vowels, a uh and a. Uh. This is the kind of special stuff that keeps language nerds infatuated with indigenous Caucasian languages. Indigenous means something special here. See, for linguists, there are languages of the Caucasus, and then Caucasian languages, these smaller families born in and limited to the Caucasus. A few vowels, many consonants, including throaty sounds. Ha, ha, ha. English has one such sound. Arabic, several. No competition for these Caucasian tongues. Oh, and they probably had even more in the past. But the real Caucasian hot topic came from one example in an old grammar of Tsobatush. There was an intransitive verb with a subject that could resemble an object. I fell, and it was my fault, like, on purpose. Versus fell me, on accident. It sounds simple, but the implications were huge. This example fell into the right hands, and the concept of ergativity became a... But the implications were huge. This example fell into the right hands, and the concept of ergativity became a linguistic rock star. In 1770, a German naturalist set out on an expedition to the Caucasus. Trekking with a royal Kabardian and Georgian entourage, he took notes and divided Caucasian languages into four families, each one with its own proto-language. And he did this over a decade before a well-known speech by Sir William Jones that drew attention to classifying Indo-European. Later, there did come a one-family-fits-all push to bundle them into Ibero-Caucasian. The idea ultimately failed to win converts. Today, we count three families. Northwest, Northeast, South. The South, Kartvelian, includes Georgian, an indigenous language with its own ancient literature. And the reason why Joseph Stalin, a native Georgian, had hot accent patterns in his speeches. So Latush, though, that's in Northeast Caucasian, a family native to the border republics of Dagestan and Chechnya. Chechen has an oddly large number of vowels for a Caucasian language. This line marks a republic where they speak a Georgian dialect. They're on good terms, but not so in these dots, where they broke away in 1992 with 13 months of ethnic strife. The local Abkhaz is part of Northwest Caucasian, the family of Circassian and your old continental friend, Ubik. This family has been blamed for making Caucasian hard to classify. See, they have these roots with one measly consonant, and they do something called head marking. As a result, they can lose resemblances more quickly, making it harder to compare them and find siblings. Caucasian isn't one family. Is it one area, though? Perhaps the languages coexisted long enough to pick up each other's habits. It's not out of the question, we saw how it happened in Mesoamerica. It's still debated if this even fits for the Caucasus. So maybe not a language area, but definitely an area with lots of languages. And you've still got to be wondering, why? Why so many? Joanna Nichols tells us the answer may not be on these speakers' lips, but under their feet. Geography gives some families spread zones, easy terrain for expanding. Other terrains are residual zones, holding languages in place. Which zone is responsible here? I hope you said both. Languages from the lowlands flow into the area, but then the mountains keep them. So the three Caucasian families survived in place and didn't spread beyond. Over time, others passed through and got stuck, and the diversity grew. We end up with this map, a map of more than 50 languages across seven families, each splash of color with its own stories to tell. Stick around and subscribe for language. So, what's the end result of this conversation? That many of these languages were similar, but yet very different. So, fits very well in this region particularly, where the languages had similarities, as mentioned in the beginning of the video. Let me show you that chart that they made. <coughs> Uh, here, inshallah, we will see this chart. So where they're comparing here the word door. Wow. In Armenia, a door sounds similar. Dur. But Armenian is a separate Indo-European branch. Very unique. So, similar but different. As if they couldn't understand, but they could get understand. And they got his message, but it may not have been that easy. To get now what's the main point here the main point here is that we have been able to identify three landmarks a mountain 
a mountain with a language that would be hard to understand. The qualities of the Black Sea with fresh water, inland, dark, murky, on and on, pirates, all that. You have the in a desert where there's the hadith of Khorasan of Merv. It Khorasan means the place from where the sun rises. And then you have this mountains, the Caucasus Mountains, that fits the language uh, of that area based upon what we read from the surah and put all the three landmarks together. This is the region we're talking about. So when these people that spoke this difficult language that was hard to understand, they asked Zulqarnain to put a wall because north of that wall there was a facade of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. This is what I wanted to touch upon, that what is this land that is north of these Caucasus mountains? Now let us see that, okay? So we have, for example, the one of the walls, there are many walls in this area, I'm not going to talk about that today, but one of the walls is the Darbant wall, okay? And then the other uh, uh, walls in this area, okay? There are many other walls around this area. But it is the north of this that what the first Jewish empire is established. And uh, ironically, this first Jewish empire after the fall of the temple that is established, this Khazaria empire, uh, is Europeans, uh, pagans, uh, barbarians that accepted the Jewish religion. And uh, they were very close to maybe accepting Christianity or Islam, but they chose the Jewish religion. And then over time got intermixed with the Jews of Spain and others, which I'm not going to go into today. But this is the region that today has become Ukraine. And the same Khazaria mafia still exists there. As you know, the president is Jewish. And so <clears throat> let so this Khazaria Empire, as will be described by this professor, to debate with in the Povest, they brought them from. So this lecture is about Jewish history in Ukrainian maps, which I'll be talking about more. But this is talking about Khazaria and Kiev. Kiev is the capital of Ukraine today. How Kiev became Jewish, and how Ukraine is now also uh, the the capital of Ukraine is Kiev. The and the Kiev was the main center of the Jews of Europe when this empire was established. And remember, Jews have been looking for an empire for a long time. So when the Jews of the Mediterranean and Spain and Egypt heard about the Khazaria Jews, they were like very like, oh wow, we have an empire. So now let's listen to him just a little bit to get an idea. And then I'll talk about Ukraine and how this all fits in with the rising of the sun, okay? Um, Khazaria. Khazaria is a fascinating chapter in Jewish history. We don't have a lot of time to explore right now, but it was, according to medieval sources, a, um, a, a medieval Jewish kingdom that existed between the Black and the Caspian Seas, as you can see here, for actually several hundred years. Now, there's a lot of questioning among uh, Jewish historians about what is the extent of the conversion of these local peoples to Judaism. There are some scholars who believe that it's all a myth that was made up in the medieval ages. Um, other scholars retain that it was in fact a Jewish kingdom, but the Judaism was quite attenuated. Perhaps it wasn't rabbinic Judaism, not for our discussion today. But it is interesting to note that there were definitely Khazarian Jews who were active in Kiev. One of the most fascinating documents emerged from this period is this document, which was a letter called the Kievan letter discovered in the Cairo Geniza. The Cairo Geniza is a collection of medieval documents, primarily written in Hebrew characters, sometimes in Judeo-Arabic, sometimes in the Hebrew language. Um, and this was a document, a purported from Kiev itself, that was a letter of introduction for a Khazarian Kievan uh, alms collector, tzedakah collector. And this was what we would call in modern Jewish parlance, a petek, a little document that he would use. And the document talks about how, you know, he's a member in good standing of the community, he's fallen in hard times, would you please help him out with the donation? And especially interesting is that there are several signatures, as is typical even in the 21st century, signatures of various dignitaries uh, attesting to the truth of this person's bona fides. And one of those doc one of those signatures is written, as you can see here, in Turkic runes, uh, rather than in Hebrew, which would suggest that one of the officials, the Khazarian Jewish officials living in Kiev, uh, was not sufficiently literate in Hebrew to be able to sign his own name, but nevertheless was a figure of some importance. So what we know is that there were Jews living in Kiev, uh, 
uh, in uh, the period of Cave and the Rus. And by the way, there were Jews there much earlier. We believe that there were Jewish uh, you know, settlements and trading posts on the Black Sea, but very, very little data is available about them. But definitely by the time you get to the 8th, 9th, 10th century, there is a Jewish presence in Cave. There is even, in fact, a member of the uh, rabbinic school of Tosafot, which left a very extensive commentary in the Talmud, who was called Moses of Cave. There's several other figures from this period that indicate that there were Jews living there even at the very beginning of Ukrainian history. Now, what happens to Cave and the Rus is it is overrun by the Mongols, and so there's a period when Mongols take over the entire territory. And when the Mongols finally recede, then the region of Ukraine is eventually absorbed into a very large state, which is called the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, formed largely by a dynastic union between Polish and Lithuanian royalty. And as you can see, it's quite a massive state. It includes uh, what would be today, you can see that has modern boundaries on it, uh, the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and extends through Belarus and much of Poland, and includes a big chunk of Ukraine, not quite reaching down to the Black Sea. And to this region, you have a massive influx of Jewish migration that extends from the 11th century onward, especially peaking around the 16th century. Um, and the reason why Jews are especially moving to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which is dominated by Ukraine in the southern regions, is because they are being driven out from the west by an increase in anti-Semitism, charges of the infamous blood libel, uh, host desecration stories, um, the persecution after the Black Death of 1347-48. These are driving Jews to the east. At the same time, there is an economic vacuum that is attracting them to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. The reason for this is primarily because Jews become part of a complex um, economic system in which Polish landlords who hold large Ukrainian holdings called Latifundia hire Jews essentially to be leaseholders, to be middlemen for them, collecting income in the form of uh, various types of taxes on produce, uh, poll taxes, uh, taxes for crossing bridges, all kinds of things. This system, also known as tax farming, or the arenda system, was definitely exploitative. Uh, the Polish landlords had very little incentive to minimize their rapacious demand. So, <coughs> let me now mention so what does this tell us? This The Jews came here, they became tax collectors, and the local people obviously didn't like that. And that's a whole history that I will go into later. But what I wanted to mention is Ukraine was a place. Kiev, Ukraine was a place where the Jews migrated to, partly because this is where their old empire was. Many Jewish sects uh came out of this area. Uh, many writings of the Talmud came out of this area. So it's a very important area for the Jewish people. There's absolutely no doubt about that. So when Zulqanain puts that wall there, okay, when he puts that wall, the north of that wall is Ukraine. The north of that wall is the area that is told to ya, to Zulqarnain that inna ya'juja wa ma'juja mufsiduna fil ard the north of this place is where ya'juj and ma'juj are causing corruption in the land so now what does that tell us that tells us that what is currently happening in Ukraine is extremely important according to Sut al-Kahf and what this tells us that the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the setting of the sun before the rise of the sun, the setting of the sun will happen at a, metaf at a metaphorical level when you read the Qur'an. Let me share with you. When you read the Qur'an, you always find, for example, I will show you, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this light after the darkness. Allah mentions the light after the darkness. The morning light after the still of darkness. Let me share with you some examples of this. So we have, for example, Studuha. Okay? By the morning light, that after every darkness there will be light. And this is what the Muslims in Mecca were being told over and over again. There's darkness now, but there will be light. And so when the sun sets, this is the sign that there will be darkness. And the morning light. And by the night when it is still. When it settles. In another place, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the same point again. yaksha, And by the night when it overcomes, when it comes, overshadows everything. Again, the intent is to express the night 
before the day. And when the day is mentioned, it is mentioned like in Surah Al-Duha with the point that there a light will come after the darkness. وَالْدُحَا وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا سَجَى وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَى وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا تَجَلَّى And by the day when it becomes bright. وَمَا خَلَقَ الذَّكَرَ وَالْأُنْثَى Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Duha, for example, شَمْسِ وَالشَّمْسِ وَالْدُحَاهَا وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا تَلَاهَا وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا جَلَّاهَا وَالْلَيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَاهَا وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا تَجَلَّاهَا وَالْلَيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَاهَا And Allah continues again, night and dark. But most of the time it's dark. The idea is that there is going to be light after dark. Okay? In the Quran. Uh, just as another example. وَالْفَجْرِ وَلَيَالٍ عَشَرٍ By the morning light, after 10 days of uh, after the 10 nights. Okay, this is maybe referring to the 10 nights of Ramadan and then the Eid of the Fajr of Eid or the 10 days of Hajj and then the Eid of Hajj. Allah knows best, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also then mentions this process of light and day in the sense of that there is light at the end of the tunnel. It looks dark. Right, and so when the when the sun is setting, and by the way, also in this process, I want to mention one day with Allah, meaning one day and night with Allah is a thousand years. Allah mentions this in the Quran, and half a day for five hundred years is mentioned in the Hadith of Sahih Bukhari. Okay, I don't have. I will show you references at another time where I talk about this in more detail. So between the sun going down and the sun coming up, in this case, is almost 500 years. The number given for the rising and the setting of the sun in the case of Ashab al is 310 years. Now, <coughs> when the sun goes down, that is a sign that first there will be darkness. And then the sun rises is a sign that the sun will eventually rise because there's after every darkness, there's light. And the region where the light will come from is the land of Khorasan, one of the places. And then where is this fitna going to start? Inna ya'juja wa ma'juja mufsiduna fil ard. Indeed, Ya'juj and Ma'juj are causing fasad in the world to bring fasad to the world, and they are the ones that affect the West. And that is the, the people north of the Caucasus Mountains. It is the Khazaria Mafia that has brought the destruction to the world, while the world stays blind. And so this is what it seems that at a metaphorical level, the Qur'an is pointing to the fact that the sun will go down, guidance will go down, but the guidance will come back up. And the Qur'an is telling us that this area in the middle will have a big role to do with it. These Khazarians that were barbarians, and then when they came back in the empire, they came back as tax collectors, and then the facade continues. That will be for another day. But I want you to consider the setting of the sun and the rising of the sun, this order mentioned in Quran. And I want you to consider why Ashab al Allah mentions the rising of the sun first and then the setting of the sun after. And then they were in the middle. وَهُمْ فِي فَجْوَةٍ min, And they were in between this between the rising and the setting. They were in between, in the, in the middle of the cave, right? And so the Ashab al-Kahf represent Muslims who are trying to protect themselves in the cave. How long will they have to find this protection? And this setting of the sun, and then till its time of rising, will take some time also. And so these are some things that I want you to consider. And more importantly, to consider that why Allah points to Ukraine. 
If you look at the Surah Al-Kahf in its larger context, it seems this area is the area from where fitna will start. And the warning that is begin given in the beginning of Surah Al-Kahf, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, so we will warn you of a severe punishment, number one. And we will warn you of a severe war, number two. Because Ba'asan Shadida is used for both in Quran. And so a severe fasad will lead to severe punishment, will lead to severe wars. And where will this start? The countdown of that starts from what you are seeing in Ukraine today. Because when you see fasad in Ukraine, when you see injustice in Ukraine, when you see funny things happening in Ukraine, like biolabs, like Jews with neo-Nazi symbols, and with uh, white supremacists, Nazis being given air again, and billions and billions of dollars again, then you have to know something is up. <clears throat> now, there's a lot more to say, but I will end here and let you think about Surah Al-Kahf. Friday is coming in two days, so you will get an opportunity to review Surah Al-Kahf and try to see if you can educate me in something that maybe I missed. But definitely, you will be able to at least see that there is a certain region that Allah is pointing to, everything from the Khorasan area to the Black Sea area, and then the north of that, the Caucasus Mountains, is where the facade will begin. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and guide us and help us and give us true understanding of the deen and keep us away from speculations and to study the deen in the proper way with the proper methodology and to hold on to our tradition, our Islam, our traditional Islam, not to be affected with modernity and its corruption. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all. Amin. Allahumma amin ya Rabb. That in this place of Ukraine is definitely going to create problems for us in the world, everyone. In the end, I will say please do consider uh, reading my comment section. Please do consider subscribing and please do consider donating because I'm trying to get a few projects done. If Allah puts it in your heart, de definitely do donate. Um, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.